Come, Holy Spirit, be in this place. Set our hearts on fire with your love. What we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. Who we are not, make us. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, a blessed Mothering Sunday to you. For those of you who are not exactly from the liturgical tradition or don't live with the calendar of the church in your head, this is the fourth Sunday in Lent. It, like the third Sunday of Advent, is a day upon which we ease slightly the fast that precedes the feast that is coming. Advent 3 is preceding Christmas. Lent 4 is preceding Easter. And on these two days, in some places, there is even an easing of the visual fast. Maybe flowers come back. Maybe there are pink vestments instead of purple But there's a discreet, distinct change. And one of the things that happens on both of these Sundays is that the scriptures somehow are served up to us in a way that make it easier for us to appropriate them, and they perhaps do not dwell in the high theology of what the church does the other 50 weeks of the year, and really do ask some pretty simple questions of us, give us some pretty simple examples And so it is that on Lent 4, what do we get? We get this lovely stretch out of numbers. Now, I got to tell you, I love it when God cleans house like this. I really do. They're out there in the wilderness. They are being led by Moses, and they're complaining about the food as though it were a menu on a cruise ship. And it's not. I mean, the the smart money would have been on saying something like, I'm really glad we have something to eat. And that's not where we are. So it is that the dim-minded, basically ignorant. I don't know that people are always intentionally ungrateful. I think they are ungrateful a lot of the time, but I think it's simply because they're not realizing what's in front of them and how their lives would be without God's presence in them, and they complain And God says, watch this. You don't like snakes? We're getting ready to do snakes. And so he does. To the point that the people's attention finally is gotten, they run to Moses and they said, okay, look, we've been bad-mouthing you and we've been bad-mouthing you and God together and we're really sorry. Could you do something about the snakes? And God answers that in a very interesting way. God directs Moses to put a serpent, a sign of the evil, onto a pole. And God does not take away the serpents. Read what the text says. It does not say that like Patrick of Ireland, Moses banished the snakes. No. What it says is, he puts the serpent on the pole, and whenever somebody gets bitten, they look at this emblem of healing, and they are saved. See, that's a genie that once set free from the bottle cannot be put back in. You get God's attention like this, and you really don't like it, and the consequences have to do with what next Not the removal of something, but the addition of something. It's called the addition of saving grace. All of us, I love the stretch from Ephesians, all of us were children of wrath. All of us are children of wrath. Like children throwing a tantrum, we can complain about the menu in the wilderness. We can do this and that and the other thing and Somehow or other, I'm certain that must be very tiresome to God. But what we see in John's gospel is the New Testament mirror of exactly what happens in Numbers. Jesus refers to himself now as the bronze serpent that would be raised up, not on a pole, but on the cross, so that 
When we are in trouble, we look to him. We looked to that image of sacred healing and are saved. We are preserved. Our lives are not lost. Now that's a pretty interesting image, isn't it? That Jesus would be willing to take to himself that image out of that moment in our life as God's people by which we were getting it so wrong that it will be to him and to him alone, our faith says, that we will look and be saved. I don't know about you, I'm old enough to remember the Sunday funny papers being in color. Anybody remember that? And I used to think in my lovely sort of four-year-old way that maybe we did them in color for Jesus because it was Sunday. I wasn't really sure about that, but I loved reading the funny papers every day and certainly on Sunday. And I remember with particular admiration a particular strip called Pogo. Anybody remember Pogo? This was a possum who lived in a swamp and dispensed pithy aphorisms and wonderful wisdom that really, in a very short sentence, bore tremendous freight. And I think perhaps my most favorite image out of Pogo was the one of Pogo the possum sitting on a log in the swamp, sort of like Rodin's thinker, sort of thinking, pondering, And the balloon over his head says, we have met the enemy, and he's still us. That's where these scriptures take us today. They take us to the place where in order to get anywhere, in order to be preserved, in order to not get so stuck in our own stuff, we have to look outside ourselves. And that's particularly difficult for Episcopalians. We are such nice people. God, we are so polite and we're well-dressed, well-spoken people. We, just, we do evangelism assuming that people will just like us and come be with Jesus. And one of the things that we are particularly susceptible to is the 4th century heresy called Pelagianism. This is the jargon that you can shock and annoy your brunch partner with today. Pelagianism. It is that mistaken, wrong-headed understanding of Christian doctrine that says that you in some way or other can help God save you. The image is if you reach up in some way or other, you shorten the distance that God has to reach to get to you. Silly us. Silly, silly us. Pelagianism. It's an egocentric heresy that depends upon the fact that we're just so nice and so sincere. And the truth is that the salvation that is provided to us by the serpent in the wilderness and by Jesus on the cross, these images to which we look, is a salvation that reaches all the way to us. It is nothing more or less than our eyesight, not our weak-minded attempt to shorten the distance that will save us. And so we are invited on the fourth Sunday in Lent, just as we are on Advent 3 with a different set of scriptures, to answer a very easy question. It's a yes-no question. The question is, do you believe this? Do you believe? Are you able to operate with the simple belief that Jesus is not your personal development guru? He is your Savior. And being your Savior, it is to Him and to Him alone that you are invited to look. That's both very easy and very hard to do. Because we are well-intentioned, we are basically good, terribly flawed, but basically good, and we want to do what we can, and really the only way out of the hole of our condition is to stop digging, is simply to look, to be about the business of gazing upon that saving focal point 
whatever it may be, whether it's a snake in the desert with Moses or a cross with Jesus, and just say, my God, I'm glad I have you to look at. I am so grateful that there is a way for me, in spite of myself, to be redeemed, to be held by you, to be made acceptable in a way that I couldn't make myself acceptable to me, much less to you, to simply look upon you and say, thank you. Now, while that is, in fact, some fairly sophisticated theology, and there's several centuries, if not the better part of a millennium in its development before it became full-flowered what it is, it's a simple question. Do you believe? Are you willing to admit the possibility in your life that despite your best and your worst urges, despite being a child of wrath, as Ephesians says it, and wanting to do as much as you can to draw closer to Jesus in your best moments, that in spite of all of that, it is simply about looking and saying, yes. So this is the pause in the fast. We have been saying our prayers in a different shape and way. We've been leading with the confession. We've been opening the liturgy in Lent in such a way that we are clearly in a penitential stance. And right here in the middle of it, we get this little breathing room. The depth of that shallows up just slightly for us to breathe a little more deeply and say, can I just say yes to this? Am I able? Am I willing? Am I capable at all to just say yes? The corollary, the derivative, the codicil, if you will, to the question is, can you take yes as an answer from God. Can you? Because that's where we are. Look upon the image and be saved and say thank you. And from that moment, then we'll turn an entire life and some very elegant theology and speech and hope some redeemed action will derive. But it is upon the turning point of taking yes as an answer from God that it all begins. Let us be about that work. I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to have to answer when I get to the other side for having said, no thank you, sir. I would much rather get there and say, thank you, this is better than I could have imagined. Amen.